Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our fourth webinar in the Mental and Behavioral Health webinar series that the National Indian Health Board is hosting. My name is Courtney Wheeler, and I'm currently a public health program manager here at the National Indian Health Board. Um, before we get started, there are a few things I would like to go over, and then I will turn it over to our presenter, Lori Jump. First, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording and the slides will be available on our website within a few days. After this webinar, you will receive a link to an evaluation. We ask that you complete this eval as it helps us for future webinars. I also want to mention we will be using the chat box for the Q&A portion of this presentation. The chat box is located at the bottom of your screen. A little bit about NIHB. We are an organization founded by the tribes and we advocate on behalf of all of the federally recognized American Indian and Alaska Native tribes in the United States. We have three departments in our organization, Public Health Policy and Programs, which is the department that I work in. We also have a policy center as well as congressional relations. Lori, if you're ready, I will turn it over to you. Okay, great. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Um, I am Lori Jump and I'm with Strong Hearts Native Helpline. Um, I've been working in the field of domestic violence for about 30 years now. I'm starting as a, an advocate in my own home community of Sault Ste. Marie. Um, so I've, I'm have kind of one of the older, <laughs> the old dogs that are working in the field. Um, and just as a quick overview, um, we know today that there are 570 plus, I believe the actual number right now is 574 federally recognized tribes throughout the country. We have more than 60 state recognized tribes. Um, and tribes share a unique legal relationship with the U U.S. government. Our status is as a um, tribal nation, and with tribal nation status, you know, we enjoy sovereignty, right? Um, so, and that gives us the power to govern our people as we see fit. Um, so, tribes have the responsibility and the authority to create tribal codes, including criminal codes, child welfare codes, juvenile justice codes, all of those things to help um, govern our communities. Um, and we know that in our history, you know, our people really enjoyed vibrant societies that were rich in history and culture and traditions. Um, but as, you know, the United States grew and, you know, all of the tactics that were used across um, Indian country you know, we, we lost a lot of um, what we celebrate about our history. Um, and when we talk about one of the biggest impacts of colonization, you know, I think that we can directly um, trace back, you know, I, I believe that our, the high rates of violence that we experience in our community is directly related to um, colonization and the things that we experienced. Um, as you can see from this slide, the rates of violence in our communities is, is unbelievable um, and unacceptable for sure. Um, you know, as a population, Native Americans suffer the highest rates. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, really unfortunate what our people are experiencing. Um, but there are a lot of people, you know, advocates, judges, prosecutors who work every day to reduce violence in our communities. Um, and it's a fight, you know, it's not something we can do alone. We need everyone to work with us and to recognize um, the violence and recognize the impact it has and to just really take a stand against it. And our people um, really do experience some pretty unique barriers that are not found in other communities. Um, you know, just the fact that we really are, you know, I, I, I think we Native Americans tend to live by the creed that we are all related. And we mean that in the best way. Um, you know, I think we, as Native Americans, we have a responsibility to care for each other. Um, and, and that has pros and cons, you know, in when we're in very small communities, um, you know, having everybody caring for you and knowing your business can, can make it hard to reach out for help. Um, but probably the biggest 
issue that we have um, is the jurisdictional issues that victims face um, in Indian country. You know, it's uh, tribal nations often do not have the jurisdiction to prosecute um, perpetrators of crimes, not, certainly not just domestic and sexual violence, but these ones are, are the ones that I'm most concerned with. Um, and that's a huge problem. You know, um, it's, you know, it can make victims feel very much alone, that nobody is there to help them, that the people that are there to, to, to protect and keep them safe are unable to do their jobs. And so um, that is one of the many barriers that we face. Um, you know, and when we talk about domestic violence, we know that it impacts our children as well. Um, you know, it's really hard to get accurate information, accurate statistics, um, you know, regarding child abuse because, you know, the national um, forums that track it really use state and county statistics and they don't include tribal statistics so if a tribal court prosecutes somebody or you know takes children um, into care those cases are not showing up in some of the national databases and and that really is a problem for us um, but we do know that you know people that abuse their partners are very much more likely to abuse their children we know that children who are exposed to violence are more likely to use violence, um, and that you know this exposure to violence can um, cause long-term um, effects of trauma. I know uh, and when we look at trauma, you know what are the results of being exposed to trauma? Um, and especially when we're talking about children, you know, this is, again, sometimes information is hard to find that specific to Indian country. And so this was, this information actually comes from a study that um, UNICEF did. And basically it was a study of the studies that were out there. So they took a lot of the studies around child welfare and child abuse and child neglect and um, exposure to violence and they you know kind of combine the statistics and analyze them um, and so children who witness violence are three times likely more likely than somebody that did not to experience ptsd as those who don't um, you know and the behavior changes are are many they can include emotional distress they can cause sleeping problems um, fearing, fear of being alone is a big one. You know, if mom is leaving, going to work or whatever, and a child is so afraid that they're not going to come back. Regression is something um, to keep an eye out, you know, acting like a baby, more immature than, than they have been. Um, it, you know, even wetting the bed. When it comes to school, we know that um, kids exposed to trauma suffer from poor concentration they are not able to focus, so they don't do well in school. Their reading ability is much lower than average. Um, and you know what, if you can't read, you don't pass. Um, so we see a lot of increase in um, children having to repeat grades um, once they're you know, exposed to um, you know, this being at home with a, a violent parent. Um, these children are often overrepresented in juvenile justice systems because you know what? They, they act out. Um, they get into fights. They are truant. Um, and so you see them being pulled into court systems more often than those who are not ex um, exposed to trauma. Early pregnancies is, an, is another issue. Um, children who you know, are exposed to trauma tend to go looking for love and acceptance someplace else, and, and they end up, you know, they're unprepared for the consequences of having sex at such an early age. So you see, you know, that, those early pregnancies. Again, these children, um, you know, they learn what they live. Um, and so children who are exposed to domestic violence are the, the bullies at school, you know, when they're younger, 
in middle school, you see that aggression coming out and they're bullying other kids. Um, and, you know, they're the fighters that, you know, as I said, you know, get thrown out of school for fighting in school when they're in high school or something. You know, these kids have been exposed to this trauma and this is how they, they um, respond to that. Um, you know, and perpetrators and victims, um, one of the things that this study found that UNICEF did again was, you know, the single best predictor if somebody will become either a perpetrator of violence or a victim of violence is whether or not they grew up in a home with domestic violence. Um, and so that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big, you know, predictor um, and something that is really concerning to us. Um, and, you know, as if being, as if coming from a home where there's violence isn't enough. Right now, you know, the entire world is experiencing this global pandem pandemic and, um, you know, and not really knowing how to deal with it. I think just adults, myself, you know, we our, our world changed in early March. Um, you know, we've been ordered to stay at home, to wear masks when we go out. Um, we're not able to, do, some of us are not able to go to work. Other people like those in the health field, you know, they have to go to work and maybe they don't want to. Um, so there's a lot of stress. Um, this sheltering in place is, is really a difficult situation if the person you are sheltering with is violent. Um, many closures of the safe places where, where women might have been able to seek shelter. Shelters are full. They're not taking new people. Um, you know, some of our um, tribal communities use hotel rooms as safe shelter if they don't operate a shelter. And, you know, a lot of those hotels were closed during this time. And so, you know, that's been a, 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 something that we've seen at the helpline has been this really increased difficulty at finding shelter for people that are seeking it. Um, you know, there's a loss of income um, and this inability to find needed supplies. Um, you know, toilet paper was the first one, right? Nobody, I couldn't find it. I thank God I had a, a large package <laughs> when this whole pandemic started because it took me about a month to be able to buy any. And when I found it, I felt like I had hit the jackpot. You know, it was just like, oh my God, there's toilet paper. Um, but it's not just toilet paper, you know, bleach, um, the ability just to keep our own homes clean, um, you know, uh, and disinfected. We've not really been able to do that unless you know, unless you really took this seriously right from the get-go and, and started to stock, stock up on things. I didn't, honest, I'm not gonna lie. I, I, I thought this was not as serious as it was. Um, so I was a little less prepared than others perhaps. Um, but the isolation too is something that, you know, has been very hard, I think, on, on just everybody. And so when you add on top of that, that somebody is either, you know, in a violent relationship and now they cannot leave and they don't have, they're not able to see their friends and family to, to get the support they need. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult for them. And the impacts of the social, social isolation, sorry, I have a hard time saying that. Um, has in, infected all of us, right? We, I think we've all experienced some version of this at one time or another, whether it's the loneliness um, because we can't see people that we're used to seeing, whether it's depression because we're in you know, anxiety, we're not sure quite what's gonna happen when things are gonna get back to normal or even what a new normal is going to be. Or be. This, um, the fear of, contracting this virus and maybe bringing it home to your children or, you know, if you care for somebody that has an um, immune deficient system that they have to worry about that. Nobody wants to lose somebody that they love. And so the fear has been um, pretty high, I think. And that just equates to more stress. Um, you know, I think I've heard that 
the um, sales for wine and beer and alcohol have really gone up during this past couple of months. I think that, you know, that glass of wine every couple of you know, couple times a week has turned into, you know, something a lot more serious. And so we see those, um, you know, the sales of that going up quite high. And all of this has combined to, to really into like a perfect storm for somebody that's in a um, unhealthy relationship that's sheltering in place with their abusive partner. Um, and we know that the violence is increasing. Um, you know, as I said, it's really hard to get statistics, um, especially in a short period of time, um, and especially in Indian country, but there have been many reports about how the, you know, calls to law enforcement for domestic violence have gone up. Um, and so we know that there's been an increase in violence, um, you know, happening during this, this time, time period. And, you know, it's not just us as adults, our children are experiencing all of these things too. You know, they're not able to go and see their friends. They are stuck at home. It's a completely different situation for them. You know, they, they had to, you know, have parents try to be their teachers and, some parents did great at it, and a, but a lot of them didn't. You know, I, I have to admit that I was not one that would have done great um, in this situation. So I'm really happy that my children are all, all older. Um, but, you know, I think the, the thing is, is that many of our children are, you know, are not old enough to have developed really healthy coping skills. And so it's been, you know, an increased... Um, burden, I think, for parents as they're, they're trying to work with their children through something that nobody in our lifetime has ever experienced. So we're not quite sure what to do with that. Um, well, one of the things that we can do is, is to help people that are in need um, is to develop a safety plan. And, you know, this is really just a, a, a very common sense practical plan that can help somebody deal with um, a bad situation um, and kind of figure out what to do if situations get worse. Um, you know, we know that during violent situations, it's very hard to think clearly. Um, if, you know, if you're interested at all in the neurobiology of trauma and how the brain reacts under extreme stress, um, Dr. Rebecca Campbell from the Michigan State University has got some really just so interesting um, videos online. You can Google her and watch them. And I, I recommend that you do. It's, it's fascinating how our brain works differently and it really determines whether or not, you know, we freeze or what are the three F's, um, you know, whether or not we fight, freeze or flee. And so, but it's, it's um, not necessarily in our control. And so it's really important to do these safety plans when you're in a calm, safe situation where you can think through what your options are and, you know, do it when you're not under extreme stress. Um, so for victims of domestic violence, you know, we always talk about how to stay physically safe, um, you know, and there are a couple of things that you can do, you know, figure out what are the safest areas in your home. We know that we don't want people to have fights in their kitchens and their bathrooms. There's a lot of very hard surfaces there. Um, knives, there are a lot of things that can be used as weapons in those rooms. And so we always try to, you know, recommend that if a fight breaks out that you don't go to those rooms or if you're in one of the, those rooms, figure out how to get out of there and, you know, get into another area. Um, keeping your cell phone charged, you know, so that if you have to make a phone call, it's, it's, you have a full battery, you don't have a dead phone. Um, choosing outfits that have pockets so that you can keep your phone on you at all times. 
um, and practicing escape routes from each room. And like I said, even though these seem like common sense, um, when you're in a, a situation of very high stress, your brain doesn't think clearly. It think, you know, works in a completely different manner. And so practicing these is important. Um, really making sure that, you know, you know the be- your house like the back of your hand and, and how to get in and out is um, incredibly important. Um, safety planning for children. Um, you know, again, very, some common sense stuff. Making sure your kids know how to call 911. Not every child does, depending upon their age. Um, and knowing when they should do so. So a lot of times we talk to um, people about having a code word with their children, right? And if I say this to you, you know to, to do one of several things and one of them might be calling 911. Um, is there, whether or not, is there some places it's safe for your child to leave home? How old are they? Can they walk to the neighbor's house? Is there a relative that li- lives nearby? And so is there a safe place for them to go if you were to give them this code word? Um, You know, if they can't do that, you know, and there's a lot of reasons why they might not be able to, it might be the middle of the night, it might be, you know, a blizzard out there, um, you know, then where are they safest at your home? And kind of figuring that out with them and making it, you know, a safe, calm environment for them that someplace that they can go um, if if a, you know a situation happens and you know I, I know that one of the things that victims often try to do they, they don't want their children to experience this they don't want their children to to see what happens and so you know telling them to go to their their bedroom or wherever or another safe space um, is something that we always recommend and teaching your children really just to never interfere. Um, I think, you know, our, our kids want to help. They, they want to protect mommy or daddy, whichever, you know, whoever the um, victim is. Um, And, you know, they'll often try to place themselves between um, the two parents and that's never a good thing. Kids can get hurt, of course. Um, And so really talking to them about that um, depending upon their age in a safe way, you know, letting them know it's not safe to do that. Um, and, you know, to just to really clearly understand that they're not to ever interfere. And really providing your child with a support system um, of people that they feel safe talking to. You know, it might be a counselor, but maybe it's not. You know, it might be an auntie or an uncle or grandparent, um, somebody that they feel safe to be able to talk about what they're experiencing and what they're feeling, you know, just to know that somebody is there for them no matter what happens. Um, And then planning for emotional safety. Um, You know, I think we, when you're talking to victims of domestic violence and you talk about how are you, how are you taking care of yourself, they almost always, you know, they, they don't feel like they have the time or the, or the right even to take care of themselves. And, you know, we have to really educate people that emotional safety is every bit as important as physical safety. Um, we have to take care of ourselves, especially when we have children. Um, you know, we can't take care of them if we're not taking care of ourselves. And that makes common sense when you're sitting here talking about it. But we, when you're in the depths of a, a, an abusive or unhealthy relationship, it's hard to think, to think about it. Um, and people often feel guilty for taking time out for themselves. Um, you know, I think if we think about just the people that we know, we can always recognize when somebody needs a timeout, right? Like when they're just overreacting or they're having a bad day. It's like, you know what, go take 10 minutes, take a breather, collect yourself, calm down. Um, So we can see it in somebody else. And yet we feel, you know, guilty for doing that for ourselves. Um, So it's not selfish. Nobody should ever feel guilty about it. Um, even 10 minutes at a time is better than nothing, right? 
exercise, yoga, deep breathing exercises. Um, our advocates will often go through deep breathing exercises with callers just on the phone to help them, you know, really calm down and, and um, you know, maintain their, their control. Walking and running, crafting, watching a movie, you know, anything that can help take your mind off of your situation, even, as I said, for a um, short period of time is very helpful. And emotional safety for kids, again, this is um, so important for our children to feel safe and loved and wanted. Um, and so how can we, how can we do that? Um, and I think it's really important for, for parents to make time to connect with their children. You know, spend some time every day with your child, check in with them, see how they're doing, talk to, talk to them about their feelings, right? Um, talk to them about what they think about different things. And um, it's, I mean, children's little minds are amazing, but, you know, making time you do, to do that every day, I think is really important in making sure a child just feels loved and, and, and safe. Um, and I think, you know, scheduling things for them. Um, I know it was really difficult at the beginning of this pandemic when, you know, parents were all of a sudden charged with being a teacher and you know, a parent and the person who was cooking dinner and, and it was a lot. But, you know, even adults benefit from a schedule and when you know what's happening, um, you're better prepared to deal with it. And so I think that's definitely is something that's very true for children that, um, you know, they, they, when they know what to expect and when to expect it, they can better handle what's going on. And so I think, you know, really setting some timelines with their kids, you know, going to bed at a certain time, scheduling, scheduling time for play or scheduling time for TV, whatever it is, just having that schedule for them can help them really feel much more safe and, and in control of their, of what's happening um, in their lives. Um, reading puzzles, Again, all of those kinds of things. And, and, and think about your kids who are missing their friends as well. You know, it's really hard to meet their needs um, when everybody's, you know, sheltering in place. And so, you know, if, if you have access to internet and a laptop or something, arranging video kind of play dates with their friends, making sure that they can still connect with their friends. Um, it's amazing to me the number of kids that actually have cell phones at pretty young ages today, um, but making sure that they have that access to kind of seek out their friends um, when they're missing them, I think is really important. Um, and so, what resources does Strong Hearts Helpline have? Um, of course, we are, you know, we have our 1 844 762 8483. Our advocates are available seven days a week um, from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., those are Central Standard Times. Um, so you can always reach out to our advocates. Um, at that and, and get support, right? We can do education, talk about um, abuse types, talk about what the red flags are, links to supportive organizations are available. Um, and something that's really new for us, um, we launched on May 18th of this year, the ability to chat with an advocate. We know that, especially during this pandemic, it may not be safe, it may not be safe to um, make a phone call if you're you know, sheltering in place with your abusive partner. Um, you can come to our website, uh, you know, and in the upper right hand corner, you'll see the little purple box that says chat now, and you can connect with our advocates like that. And again, those services are available, you know, uh, seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. 
Um, we also have a number of printed materials that are available, um, brochures, palm cards, um, posters that can be used in your, um, you know, in clinics or offices to hand to somebody that, um, you know, might, might need the information for reaching us. Um, you know, again, the brochures can be put out on tables. Um, we have the, the poster that is a tear off with our number on it. Um, people can, you know, take the number um, and being able to reach us. You can either download those at strongheartshelpline.org uh, resources, or if you want to request them, we're happy to provide those. Um, you know, we do mailings all the time of our materials out to, you know, different programs and, um, places where, where, where people visit. So it makes perfect sense for us to have these. I'd love to see them in all of our clinics. Um, and, and we work, we work to get that done, to get them out there. So you can always request those. Um, and I think that's pretty much my presentation today. Um, I don't know if there are any questions at all or comments. Just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, to please type them in the chat box and um, I will read them for Lori to answer. There is one, one question. So have you seen any changes um, now that some states are slowly opening up in regards to people seeking help or reaching out for assistance? Yeah, you know, one of the, one of the things that we noticed right away, um, and, and this kind of goes back to the beginning of the pandemic, um, really is that our, the number of calls that we received in a day really um, took a, a, a nosedive. And so our calls went down. Um, and, and I think that this is kind of true Across, you know, across the country, I've talked to other um, helplines out there and their numbers also went down. And I think it's primarily because people are not able to make those calls if their partners are at home with them 24 seven, right? And so that was really important for us to get our chat advocacy up and running as quickly as we could. Um, and we did get it up earlier than we expected. Um, but there definitely was an urgency behind getting it launched. So we were able to do that. Um, since, you know, I think there still are a lot of um, problems finding, especially, you know, shelter, um, transportation, those types of services. Many places have not opened up completely and you know, as, as the shelters filled up, you know, people didn't have any place else to go, right? And with the shelter in place, they pretty much stayed put. Um, and so it, 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 we're still having difficulty. I would say that it hasn't opened up to the point where, you know, um, it's any easier really to find shelter at this point. That's the big one. The other one is transportation. If somebody, you know, needs transportation from, you know, one area to another, um, those kinds of in-person services are still very hard to find. You know, all of our programs, you know, went into, you know, telework and working from home and just not really seeing people in person. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's been hard to still find those in-person services that you can't provide over the telephone. And, and so, you know, as things open up, we hope that that's going to change. Um, but I think it's good. It's going to take a while. I don't know if, if um, participants are aware, but shelters are very um, few and far between in Indian country. You know, I said there's 574 tribes. Well, in the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, there are um, right now in our database 57 tribally um, run or operated shelters. And so, 
you know, if, if somebody is Native American and they're really seeking culturally specific services, they're very, very hard to find. And, and shelters are almost impossible. Um, so, but, but yeah, things still remain very hard to find in, in terms of the in-person services. I'm wondering if you have any statistics <clears throat> as far as uh, uh, women committing domestic violence versus men committing domestic violence on, and what the statistics are on that. Yeah, um, you know, we, we know that men certainly are victims of domestic violence. It happens. Um, and I think what, you know, in my experience, um, it's been between five and 10% would be, you know, uh, where you, you know, male victims make up about five to 10%. That has increased somewhat more in, in more recent years. Um, I think it's become more acceptable for men to reach out. You know, there's, it, when we think about how hard it is for a victim of domestic violence to reach out, you know, in our very small, tight-knit communities, it's, it's hard. You don't want people to know your business, you know? Um, and it's doubly hard for a man to do that. But I think it's becoming a little more acceptable. And so we are seeing, you know, more male victims. Um, Certainly, some of those male victims are in same-sex relationships, um, but but we, you know, I, you know, I don't I don't think anybody that works in the field would argue that there aren't any male victims that women are not abusive because we know that there are, we know that there are abusive women out there. So, um, but it it does tend to be a, a pretty small percentage. Yeah, we're seeing um, at, at least where I work. I'm seeing a lot of um, a lot of uh, women who are being um, cited for domestic violence, and you know our, our approach in White Earth is that um, the actions with domestic violence are based on are motivated by power and control, and Absolutely. we see it. We see a lot of women that are basically trying to. Uh, I don't know, uh, trying to equalize themselves with some sort of weapon or whatever it is. And it's basically a retaliation to what's been done to them. And I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of women that are being arrested for domestic violence when at, in actuality, it, it could be an assault. There should be an assault, no doubt, no doubt about that. But then they get put in our domestic violence class and um, it's totally foreign. To, to them because um, we do classes on anger management as well. And that's a 10 week program. And our, our domestic violence program is 30 weeks. And so that's kind of, that's kind of why I'm asking the question. I just, I don't have any data or anything to prove any of this. It's just kind of what we're witnessing in, in, in White Earth, Minnesota. Yeah. You know, I think that that, um, a couple of years ago, you know, there, well, actually it's been quite a few years ago. Um, they, you know, one of the, one of the practices that was put into place was mutual arrest, right? So a lot of times if, if somebody went, you know, if an officer went to a home that, you know, had yep. a domestic violence call, you know, a lot of times they would arrest, arrest both people, right? Cause they, they didn't know exactly who was, um, I don't, I guess the instigator. Um, and, and so I think it's really important, um, for law enforcement and prosecutors to really have co good conversations about, you know, what domestic violence is. And, and as you say, um, we, it, it seems to be coming more common again, where women are getting arrested. Um, and oftentimes you know, they, it's something that they are protecting themselves. It's a situation of either self-defense or, or retaliation. Um, and so it's not truly domestic violence. And, and I think that that's, obviously it's a problem. I think it's a mistake. And I think that the treatment is different, right? Um, yes. So, so I think it's, you know, what, even, even if they've been charged, you know, the sentence, you know, if you have probation offers, officers, that kind of thing, to really have conversations 
um, with them about what the situation was and whether or not that was an appropriate charge. Um, and, and really educating your um, prosecutor is, is gonna be, is very important, you know? There's all, you know, there's a, there's a program that came out of um, the Domestic Abuse Intervention Project and, and, and I'm sure you, she, you're familiar with that, that group. Yes. Um, but it was, and I'm, I cannot come up with the name of it. It's on the tip of my tongue. And there, um, Ellen Pence worked on it. It's, it's yes. a um, series for women who do you vi use violence. And, and it, it's really incredible work. Um, and yeah, it's called I, turning, turning Points. Yes. I knew, I thought it was turning, but I couldn't come up with a second. Um, and so, so if you do have a case where women are violent, and like I said, it, it happens, um, you know, to use that with them as opposed to the um, men's re-education group that, you know, that maybe you were talking about, but. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say have some conversation with your um, prosecutor, <laughs> try to get them educated so that they're, you know, making more appropriate charging decisions. Fantastic curriculum. Yeah, yeah, we loved it. Yeah. So we have a few more questions in the chat box. Um, the first one, how do we place women and children in a DV shelter during COVID? Well, it's very hard, as I said. Um, certainly, you know, if you if you know what the resources are, you can certainly reach out to those on your own. If you don't know what resources are available to you, um, you know, our advocates at Strong Hearts Helpline can help. Um, we have built a database of um, tribally specific programs that you know we're happy to refer people to. So you know, we take calls from a lot of um, you know, social workers and program directors that are looking for services for people. Um, and we can direct you to what's available in your community. Um, if there isn't a native specific program, you know, we do have um, the names and numbers of mainstream programs as well. Um, but I think during this time period, as I said, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult to, to find a shelter that has open space. Um, you know, so a lot of times, as I said, you know, some tribes are using um, and other programs are using hotel rooms if the hotels in your area are even open. And, and I know we heard from quite a few tribes that use hotels that the hotels were, were closed down as well. So it's, it really is a, a very difficult time period to find shelter. And so it's really important to kind of go through that safety plan with somebody about how they can stay safe while they're sheltering in place with, you know, if they can't, if there's no place for them to go. Thank you. Um, the next question, do you have any specific resources for LGBTQI or two spirits? Um, another good question and another one that's hard to find, right? Um, we, our advocates have had some training with, um, somebody that's doing that work um, and so that they so that we can respond more appropriately to them when they call us but again finding specific services that are very specific to that population is very hard to find um, i think what you find is that most programs are are certainly are willing to to work with anybody regardless of of their you know their status as being lgbtq or not, um, but finding specific services is, is difficult. Um, next question, how do we place victims in shelters when children are discriminated on based on age or in some cases sex? Yeah, that's something that I think we're actually starting to see less of, um, you know, <coughs> excuse me. In, in years past, um, you know, we were not able to, to shelter males over the age of like 13, and we were not able to shelter, you know, adult children. Um, I think the adult children is still problematic, 
um, because of federal funding the way it's done. Um, but I think that most shelters um, that I am aware of have updated their policies and are sheltering both males and females, you know, certainly victims of any, regardless of age, but also, you know, um, older male children as well. Um, and that, again, is an education point, I think, for, um, for people that are, are running shelters. And, and it's something that, you know, I think is really fairly new in the last couple years. So you might not see it implemented across the country yet, but it's something that we definitely recommend is, is you know, that shelters not discriminate based on sex or age. Um, next question. Are restraining orders harder to obtain with courts being closed? Yeah, they are. Um, you know, especially I feel like for people that who are living, you know, in Indian country where you may not have access to a fax machine, you might not be able to scan something in, you know, you might, you might have a computer at home, but maybe you don't have a scanner, right? Or a printer. So, you know, a lot of forms are available online, um, but getting them printed or once they're filled out, scanned back in and sent in has been really difficult for people. And then, you know, judges aren't necessarily, they're not necessarily holding hearings every day. And so it definitely has made it more difficult to get those um, protection orders. Um, and, you know, again, what we see, you know, across the country, this certainly isn't just an Indian country, but, you know, all this responsibility tends to fall at the feet of the victims and, and it can make it very difficult for them to to get what they need to be safe. So, um, but it definitely has been harder. Um, next question, do you have policies for DV shelters during this time? Um, we, we don't, um, you know, if somebody were looking for something specific um, and wanted to reach out, I'd be happy to, to do some research and get back to you. Um, but that's, you know, that really isn't our kind of field of expertise. Um, but I do know, I do know people that work in the field and especially around um, shelter policy. So if there's something specific that you're looking for, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my, my email address is so long. It's the, it's strongheartshelpline.org, but it's just L jump. So L J U M P. Um, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to um, pass your question on to a couple of people that do work in shelter policies. Are there any more questions? If so, you can please type them into the chat box while we're waiting. Just a reminder, this recording as well as the slides will be available within a few days on our website and you will also be will be receiving and evaluation um, shortly after the end of this webinar. We do have one more question. Okay. How do we address root causes of DV, namely the ongoing effect of colonization and historical trauma into the present? Well, that's the $50,000 question right there. Um, you know, I think that it depends upon where you're trying to address that, right? I think that, you know, when we are, when we are service providers, um, you know, I think it's really important that we keep that at the front of our, our you know, at the forefront of our, our minds, right? When we're working with people is that, you know, when we look at statistics and, and Native American people, you know, if it's a good thing, we have very low rates. And if it's a bad thing, the rates are higher in Indian country. And that's, and that's, 100% a result of colonization and, you know, the lack of health care, the poverty and the, all of the things that our people experience. Um, so really being aware of that. And then if you are a program director, making sure that your policies um, reflect an awareness of that, making sure that, you know, um, that we're not continuing those policies. And, and you know, I know that a lot of federal funding comes with, with a lot of 
um, you know, requirements, um, but how you implement those. There are ways to do it. Um, and I just really encourage people to, to really look hard at what actually is required and, and, and how you can work with those policies to best serve people because, you know, we, we, it continues today. You know the colonization and the you know the impact the impact is definitely there but there are still attempts today to you know to keep those old systems in place and so really being aware of that and 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 you know educating yourself and and you know ensuring that your policies don't continue that um, colonization okay um there's a follow-up to that question a lot of public health programming is moving towards a shared factors approach such as CDC connecting the dots. Have you seen blended programming addressing the previous question? Funding streams can be very limiting. Yeah, no, that's a problem, right? Um, and I think I have to be careful. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, because I think that as a people, as a tribal nations across the country, we have to advocate for our people. And, and you know, uh, many tribes, um, there are organizations out there that advocate for changes that need to happen. Um, again, I would, you know, kind of educate yourself around that stuff if you can. Um, and you know there are a lot of a lot of times you'll see calls to action um, and and participate in those because the only way that we're going to see real change is is if we continue to advocate on a on a continuous basis for you know our relatives um, and and so figuring out a way to do that um, especially when you're federally funded can be really difficult um, but yeah it's it's something that it's it's like a huge it's a huge problem um but you know find find a way to support the advocacy efforts that are happening to make those changes we have another question um how about we start treating domestic violence as an illness and help abusers get help rather than criminal criminalize them you know i really think you're absolutely correct um you know and i think really indian country does that better than most places um you know we try I, in in the the programs that i've worked in you know have been very holistic and and really helping somebody make the changes that they need to make you know they have to be willing right they have to they have to acknowledge um so there will always be an accountability piece it, you know in my mind um you know, there's always going to be that accountability piece. But you know what? These are our brothers. They're our nephews, our uncles, our grandpas. Um, and, and we don't throw our people away. You know, so to, for me, as, as somebody that's been an advocate my entire life, um, you know, I recognize that we're not going to change this problem unless we start working with our men and helping them to find healing. And, you know, I, I think accountability is important. And I, and I really, I believe, I think it still has to be a criminal case, right? I think we have to charge them criminally because unfortunately you need something. Um, but then, you know, making sure that they get services, putting somebody in jail isn't necessarily going to change things for the better. Um, and it doesn't, stop battering behavior a lot of times people get out and they're just even more angry um you know so maybe we've we've stopped somebody from battering one woman but you know what's going to happen when he has another relationship and so i absolutely agree with that i think that we need to um, provide services and again not and i and i say men um, because that is what the highest statistics are but the fact is is we have to work with people that are are um being abusive regardless of who they are and and helping them to to heal so that they can change and that they can have healthy relationships i i 100 support that okay um we have one more question 
what community-wide culturally honoring children's activities do you recommend to interrupt the trauma of the current crisis and encourage re-engagement with parents and caregivers to protect children? You know, I think it's, it's really hard right now because, because we're not able to have those in-person um, services, right? Um, I really believe that our, our culture is where we're going to find the most healing. And I think that bringing that back, um, you know, really starting, I think it's really critical to start with kids when they're younger and really just immerse them in our culture when we can, participate in powwows, participate in ceremonies, um, teach them that respect for all living things. I think that's where our greatest hope lies for making changes. And, and I think that, you know, in terms of parenting as well, you know, I think that in terms of, you know, we see um, high rates of child abuse in our communities. It's not that I think our parents don't love our children. It's that we have learned bad coping skills, if, if we have any at all. It's a constant fight. As I said, we have the lowest rates of good things and the highest rates of bad things, whether it's mental health, substance abuse, you know, um, medical illnesses. Um, I think we have a lot on our plate. And so I, I but I truly believe that um, immersing ourselves in, in our culture and our traditions and ceremonies is, is where we can find healing um, and and, um, you know, we have to start that at the youngest ages as that we can. So that looks like it was the last question that we've received. We have time for one more question if anybody has one. I also want to mention there have been some resources shared in the chat box. Um, Someone addressed policies for shelters and mentioned that no one was really prepared for COVID, so they've kind of had to develop and create those policies um, on the fly. Um, there's also a web link um, in the chat box that everyone should probably check out as well from Johns Hopkins. And then others have mentioned culture and tradition is the cure and things of that nature. Um, so if there's no more questions, we will go ahead and wrap up. Oh, well, let's see. We have, nope, no more questions. So we'll go ahead and wrap up the webinar for today. Again, the recording and the slides will be available on our website in a few days. Thank you all again for joining us. And we hope you have a great remainder of your day. Thank you for having me. Thank you for presenting. It was a great conversation. Great, thank you. Thank you.